Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there are many, many dignitaries here, and I'm sure there are many more equally distinguished members in this audience, so I'm not going to name anybody in particular, but I'm greatly honored to be here at this gathering, and I'm particularly grateful for s to Sachinji for persistently chasing me to ensure that I am finally available to deliver a talk here. I hope I don't disappoint you, and I hope uh, I can energize you enough to listen through what I've said since you've already had a fairly long session uh, before my talk has begun. But let me get straight to the point, uh, because uh, I know time is of a premium to everybody. So I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes, and that's what I've been told to do, and I'd be available for Q&A after that, should you wish to take it on however much longer. The first clarity I wish to give is after what the distinguished General Saab has just spelt out, and this is something that takes up a lot of energy and time in, in Delhi amongst various people who claim that national security is a range of challenges that go from things like food and water security going on to economic security, and somewhere in the middle, military security and military-related issues come up. Uh, I don't want to get into that debate, because I have some very strong views on that, but I'm going to focus on the military dimensions and the geopolitical dimensions and the strategic dimensions, what we commonly understand of security. Because security, uh, for instance, when you mention the word security forces in an environment like Jammu and Kashmir, you're obviously not looking at some group of people who'll come and try and tell you how much food and water should be given to the people of Kashmir, but you'd be looking at people who will somehow assist the government of the day or the authorities to give some element of stability there to the situation, and those are uniformed personnel. I'm also of the view that external security and internal security are not two compartmentalized areas of national interest. They have to work in sync, they have to work together, and national security and therefore the composite uh, entirety of all our challenges and for any force or anybody to now think that we should be operating in watertight compartments, that this is not my area of interest and that is my area of interest. So if there is a bomb blast inside, there are police forces and there are other sort of bomb disposal uni uh, units and security forces who will take care of it and I will keep a watch on the border. I think that era is behind us. Because conventional conflicts, as we've known in the past, are not going to be of the same scale as we've known in the past. Conflicts are all going to be interlinked. They are going to be probably a sum total of the level of friction that takes place in a situation escalating finally to a physical conflict or at least the threat of a physical conflict where you will possibly see even brandishing of nuclear weapons. But understanding the entire set of challenges of national security, we need to start, to my mind, to understand the geopolitical scenario. India is a country that cannot be ignored. Our time has come and everybody in the world at least in the last 25 years, mentions India in the same breath as China and India. Though whether we'll catch up with China or not is a matter of another debate. And whether we should be comparing ourselves to a totalitarian state which says GDP rise and GDP rises. They say we don't want to see that much more population increase and therefore you cannot have that many more children. That is a different matter of another debate. We are a free society, and I would like India to be perceived by all of us as a country which is an example to the rest of the world that we have achieved all this despite our limitations, despite the challenges that we face. And one of the things that I came across many years in my studies, many years ago in my studies, is that for us, the challenges have been, and for time, for us, has been telescoped. We are being expected to perform at the levels of global governance when the rest of the Western world took two to three hundred years to get its act together. You have democracy on one side and then you are expected 
to govern with democracy, with the cacophony of democracy, with the challenges to every step of governance that we have in the case of a democratic society. And then we are expected to move rapidly forward as in the case of controlled totalitarian or police states where there is no opposition to whatever the government of the day in its wisdom decides to do. So it's a big challenge for anybody within all those challenges within to look at the picture outside of India and see where do we pitch ourselves, which boat should we step onto. You have the United States, which keeps making promises to India that it wants India to be its partner. It wants to have the most serious partnership of the 21st century with India. But is the VUS going to be willing to put its neck out for India if push comes to shove? That is the question I ask a lot of times to a lot of people who seem to have very strong pro-US leanings. I am neither for US nor against US. I am for India. And where does India's interest lie and who is going to be able to best serve our interests is where we need to pitch ourselves on. We don't need to pitch ourselves on the sides of a country which can give a handful of our IT experts fancy jobs there or get our IIT students who have been trained because of our high quality intellectual inputs in our own IITs. As somebody once said in a book I was reading a while ago to say that Getting into Harvard is a cakewalk compared to getting into IITs and IIMs. But those same students are then vying for jobs abroad. They are not looking immediately to be here. Why? Is it just the package abroad? Or is it that India cannot give them the environment to fulfill their ambitions intellectually and academically? Those are questions that need to be answered separately. But I think the most important thing for us to understand is what can we expect from the U.S. in the global environment? So when the U.S. says that it wants India to partner the U.S. in the Indo-Pacific, which is the new buzzword in security circles, which means the entire waterways from the coast of Africa to beyond Philippines and into Australia and beyond, and expects India to pitch in its navy out there, I would like to ask a number of questions. To what extent are they willing to give us the capacity building tools to be able to operate at that scale? We have a first class navy, but we don't have the bandwidth and the capacity to operate right across two oceans, not one. The second thing to understand is when the US says that we would like to have a number of foundational military agreements with you because at the end of the day, we would like you to provide us basis to be able to take on the threat of China. The question to ask is, when the last time the Chinese and the Japanese were having a standoff over a few rocky islands in the Pacific called Senkoku or Dioyu, was the US willing to come in and tell China to back off? Or the US actually said, that if Japan is the first to initiate conflicts, then I'm sorry, we'll have to keep out. Now, is that what Japan deserved after 70 years of alliance with the US? And is that what we are going to get? And should we be able to factor that into our calculations if the US is willing to go only that far and no further? then is it worth sticking our neck out and taking on American challenges? Because when you take on American challenges, ladies and gentlemen, you are going to get America's problems also. You're going to get Al-Qaeda to come and knock on your doors. You're going to get ISIS to come and knock on your doors. Today, per capita, we perhaps have one of the lowest recruitment rates of people who have been going towards the ISIS or leaning towards the ISIS. Interestingly, amongst the Western countries, amongst the highest per capita rate of people leaning towards the ISIS was countries like Australia. And Maldives next door has a very high percentage per capita because they have a small population. But the fact of the matter is because I think even terror groups worldwide are not too sure which side we are on. So they are not putting that much of interest on the radar screens of India to see whether they should get involved here. The US is in now in a state of another Cold War with the Russians. We have a very strong military relationship with the Russians. The general will bear me out. 60% or more of our military wherewithal still, though many of our, many of, much of our equipment is of vintage category, 
but military equipment if meant to last for 25 years is made to last for 40 to 50 years because we are not a rich country we make do with what we have we modify we stretch it but we get our stuff from the russians it is hardy it is cheap and the russians have always stood by us they have supported our claim for the UN Security Council. The US took a long time and even now reluctantly. In the language, yeah. The Russians have been the first country to supply us nuclear reactors. The Russians have been the first country to supply us a nuclear powered submarine. Lease was a terminology concocted to serve India's needs because international uh, regulations did not allow them to straightforward transfer it to India. But there's more to come. They've given us strategic weapon systems. They are willing to give us even more. And push comes to serve if the oil crisis in the West uh, Asian region becomes unmanageable for us, we can still look at getting some Siberian oil, if not most of our requirements from there, other than from Latin America, where we have tended to focus now to countries like Colombia and Ecuador. But the fact is, we are uh, having to make our choices and very difficult choices whether we should be in Russia's camp or whether we should be in the US camp. But there is an interesting terminology invented by an author of many serious works on security, Mr. Bharat Karnad, whose writings, uh, some of it are first rate, some of it of recent, uh, of recent vintage have come uh, with questionable reviews. But the fact is, he came up with a terminology to say India could be looking at becoming a swing state, which means when the situation demands, we swing in that direction. And we do not completely commit ourselves to either one of the two big military powers. But there is a third power in waiting, and that is China. It's militarily there, but not really there. It's economically there, but not really there. But for us, it is the big elephant in the room. So how do you manage to deal with China's ambitions? China is encircling you. There is no doubt about it. And I'm not saying it. Not every Indian hawk is saying it. A British writer who recently wrote a book called When China Rules the World, uh, Martin Jacks, and he has said it is China's policy very clearly to keep India bogged down to the subcontinent and keep it preoccupied with Pakistan come to Pakistan later, but Pakistan's nuclear program is China's nuclear program in Pakistan. Pakistan's military weapon systems all come from China, and that's why Pakistan's showing its thumb to the United States now, because it's telling the U.S. that you do not need to give us any more aid. We've sucked you enough. We'll come back to you once again, as I tell the Pakistanis, that you have been dumped by the U.S. and picked up by them, and the Pakistanis, unfortunately, uh, seem to have uh, very little sense of self-pride because as long as any country gives them sufficient wherewithal to contest India, they're quite happy. They cannot seem to look at their challenges beyond that. Then we come to the situation in the world where there is the growing threat of terror. And I'm not talking of straightforward ISIS rolling down your border areas. That's not really going to happen in a hurry, most probably never, because ISIS will have to first come in via Afghanistan and Pakistan, and they'll have to battle all the groups within Pakistan, which have been created by the state. They call them non-state actors. And I've often asked them that, how can you call yourself a sovereign state when non-state actors seem to operate from your state territory happily and occupy all the privileges of normal citizens? So either you're not in control of your state, or you're obviously patronizing them. And then, unfortunately, they, as usual, have no answers. But the fact of the matter is that the threat of terror in India is twofold for us to look out on. One is those who get swayed by international ideologies because of social media reaching out to them and converting them to say that, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate, and I believe it's on record, that less than 24 Indians have actually joined the ISIS. And those who went also ended up as drivers and masalchis, not really first-rate fighters. So the fact of the matter is that when you get motivated looking at social media propaganda through various people who give you uh, all the ideological bombardment, people don't realize that 
going there is not going to give you the tools to come back and air your grievances or fight for your grievances in Indian society. It's better to stand up and air them here without a conflict because you have the kind of free speech here that you'll never get anywhere else. So the fact of the matter is the threat of terror, one comes from outside, but more importantly is those who get swayed by outside propaganda and become threats within. And that is the threat which both has international linkages but has domestic implications. Equally important for us is the threat of cyber attacks. Now cyber threats is a very big challenge which no country to my mind has answers to. And some of the largest initiators of cyber attacks outside of China are countries like the US and Pakistan as far as India is concerned. We have been at the receiving end for much of our, uh, the cyber attacks and I'm afraid to say that while we call ourselves an IT powerhouse and a global knowledge uh, sort of power as far as IT goes, I don't think we have collectively put together forces strong enough to counter the threat of cyber attacks. And it is not just going to be on critical infrastructure, it's not going to be on our nuclear installations, it's going to be on our banking system, it's going to be on our electronic grid, and if it is in one of those areas, it is also a threat to national security because it will automatically paralyze even your defense systems which are in place to counter an air attack on India or a missile attack on India. Because Everything is interlinked to the grid and the power that we get. So cyber threats, and the big thing about cyber threats is you're not able to identify where it is coming from, who has initiated it. It is a cheap tool available to countries which are not militarily strong enough to contest you, but want to get even with you, want to derail your economic agenda, want to derail your progress. So we have to remain alert to that. I was happy to know in a recent interaction at an event uh, with the army chief, when he said that the army, at least I suggested to him, that while you create all these air defense formations and you create, you know, armored brigades and mechanized brigades and armored divisions and artillery brigades, etc., what about cyber brigades? Why don't you enroll geeks into the army? Don't ask the, them to have haircuts, don't ask them to shave, don't ask them to wear combat uniform, don't ask them to come for PD parade at 6 in the morning, but ask them to be part of the system and work in national security interest. And somehow, I am told, this idea has caught the imagination of a lot of people because the army is actually thinking of lateral and direct recruitment of people into the armed forces to actually create cyber units and cyber formation. Please understand, ladies and gentlemen, China has cyber divisions operating. Virtually every cell phone that you use has some kind of a chip put in where the Chinese want to listen, they can listen to any conversation you are having. GCHQ Cheltenham in the UK can hear any conversation anywhere in the world because there are some buzzwords uh, that are there in every conversation and the moment you use one of them, your conversation gets directed there and then they get the whole lot of the conversation. So be careful about what you say on the cell phone. <laughs> I'm just putting the fear of God in all of you. But the fact of the matter is, so these are the global threats that you are up against. And the most important global threat that we now have is the spillover effects of maritime rivalry. General Saab talked about it. Maritime threats are multiple. It threatens your economy because it has the energy routes, bulk of your energy requirements come through maritime routes. It threatens your trade because both your import, export, bulk of it is linked to maritime. And you could have another maritime based attack on one of your coastal cities as we had 10 years ago, like 2611. So maritime threats are increasing and there is a need for the government to even address that and give more resources to the Navy, which has relatively been not getting the kind of share of the budget because the budget, as I've understood, is really based on capex, opex, and also the revenue outlays, which are some standard revenues. Today, our pension requirements are exceeding our pay requirements because people are living longer. So the government can only give that much money for defense. It cannot 
divert everything else for national security because people like me are painting scenarios that your sort of doomsday is around the corner. They have to be more realistic. So you can't work on a minimalist scenario as was in 1962 where we got humiliated and embarrassed. And you can't work on a maximalist scenario where you are just spending money like crazy because you are creating scenarios hoping that some of them will fit to justify your huge budgetary requirements, as the US armed forces often do. It might interest you to know they spend more on research than we spend on our entire defense budget. But that's another story. So then we come on to the, inter, uh, the, the regional threats. The regional threat, let's start with first, and there's one other external threat, which is the stability of the oil markets. Today's news is prices have dropped. So are we going to buy more and store? Do we have the strategic storage reserve capacities to store that oil so that we don't have to buy when oil again goes more than $100 a barrel? Are we creating that capacity? Because that's another requirement, because unless you have your energy requirements sorted out, you really uh, are going to be at the receiving end. I read a very interesting piece recently in which the British experts are now looking at trying one day to give Russia one day without electricity. So Mr. Putin will suddenly know his nuclear weapons are no good because Moscow's had a blackout. Okay, now that is the kind of level of threat. So it's not just tanks and missiles you have to prepare for, but you have to prepare to firewall your key systems. So when everything goes wrong, still essentials of national security are functional because that is the sign of maybe a huge attack coming your way. So is the government of the day going to be able to have its second strike capability as is being touted with the recent induction of Arihant, INS Arihant, onto the naval fleet, which I think is a great achievement for India. But the fact of the matter is we're not fully there. We are getting there steadily and slowly. And the energy requirements are something that we need to really, really prepare ourselves for because that's going to have an implication on a number of other things. Classically, if the US decides that nobody is going to buy any more Iranian oil or face the possibility of sanctions and then a confrontation with the US government, are you going to be able to take on the US government only in the Gulf area, leave aside anywhere else? I'm not sure. And if you take on the Americans, would you be able to also take on the Saudis and the Kuwaitis and others who are lackeys of the Americans? Because that's the kind of conflict situation that would have an implication on our state of security. There's a huge Indian population. It sends in a large am amount of financial uh, support to uh, our people and uh, our economy. The repatriations are in the range of $40 billion or upwards. Now, if you have to lift those people, and do you remember some time ago, General V.K. Singh had gone in to pull out people, but it was just about, I don't know the numbers, I think it's about 4,000 people that were pulled out of there. But considering the fact there are 8 million Indians there, what is the kind of naval fleets that you will need to get 8 million people back? And would they be grateful that you've brought them back? Because many of them subsequently, when the situation stabilizes, want to go back and start earning all over again. So to what extent you need to stick your neck out? To what extent you need to have a naval fleet capable of doing that in association with civilian fleets that will become part of a naval leadership initiative? So that's another maritime challenge that you have. Now you come into the regional picture. The first regional thing that strikes me is the growing clout of the Chinese. The Chinese have bought their way into the hearts of every country in our neighborhood. Something which our Ministry of External Affairs very complacently said that this is our turf, uh, India's turf of influence. You know, this is our domain and not anymore. The Nepalese are looking towards the Chinese. 75% or more of Bangladesh weapon systems are of Chinese origins. Sri Lanka sways between India and China. And as of last month, it's gone back into China's camp from what I understand. And as of last month, Maldives has come into our camp. But how long can we keep them in our camp? And Pakistan is permanently in China's camp. So what kind of a situation that puts us in the region? Not a very happy situation to be in. 
Now let me try and make you understand each of those complexities a bit more. Why Nepal is important? Because Nepal is important because not just because it provides us a fair amount of Nepalese involvement of human resources in our system, but Nepal has a historical connect with India. You cannot have a country which has a very strong Hindu lineage suddenly operating out of China's camp. I mean, emotionally, I'm sure it will be, uh, it'll hurt the sentiments of a lot of people who always saw Nepal as our cousins, adjoining cousins next to us. So there is an issue there in terms of your emotional connect with the nation. There is an issue there in Nepal also in terms of the waterways in Nepal and to what extent the Chinese can actually, and Chinese are very good in dam building as we all know, the Chinese can actually exploit those waters and use the energy from there for China's requirement in as much as they are making four large dams on the top three rivers of the Indus system now in what we call POK and Pakistan calls Azad Kashmir. Because those dams are collectively going to give China the kind of energy that all the dams in Pakistan put together don't produce. And so China is b hungry for energy. And as China has come in out there, China is now very much party to the Kashmir dispute. The Kashmir dispute as per the UN resolution of 13th August 1948 is not an India-Pakistan question anymore. It is an India-Pakistan-China question, even if you don't count the people of Kashmiris as stakeholders to it, where they were actually marginalized completely post the Shimla Agreement of 1972. But they've come back into reckoning because of successive governments in Delhi thought that since India is also a great champion of democracy, let's give them free tickets to go all over the world and abuse us at our cost. So successive governments in India have been infamous for doing that. And the Hurriyat had therefore got emboldened and people who have secessionist tendencies have got emboldened. But the real person, the real country that has taken advantage of the complete flux in Jammu and Kashmir are the Chinese. They occupy the total territory of Jammu and Kashmir. About 50% of it is with India. I'm told it's totally made up of 84,000 square kilometers of which about 43, 44,000 square kilometers is with us, and the other 40, 42,000 square kilometers divided between Pakistan and China. So China is not a small party to it. It's not an observer from outside. It is an observer within. So there is a military threat from China on the Kashmir border. There is a military threat from China, and I've explained to you the maritime threat, the circle, around India, which they've made the string of pearls. I didn't mention, but there are ports all around India. You know, there have been ports in Burma, there have been Hambantota in uh, Sri Lanka, they've made the Gwadar port in Pakistan. They were trying to build something and they'll get back into reckoning in Maldives because they put over one and a half, two billion dollars there and they're not gonna let their money go waste. So they'll keep coming back to haunt you from all sides. And that is why they want to get into Nepal, circle you completely. And they're getting into Nepal under the pretext of A, development, B, the Belt and Road Initiative, and C, in terms of giving them huge amounts of cash to actually look at altering the political discourse in Nepal. That religion and affiliation historically with India is one thing, but your political choices is another set of things. And China is very good at that. It has no time for democracy, human rights, and all that mumbo jumbo that we seem to champion a lot about. Now, I come to Pakistan. Pakistan is a country which I said some years ago on television and I stand by it, it is the other North Korea. It is China's vassal state which is on our borders and this nonsense because it is on our borders we must go repeatedly to hug them doesn't get much merit in my thinking. But there are people who every time somebody, there is a stability in a situation. I mean, people have been asking me stupid questions like, you know, will Imran Khan alter the situation? How can he? Imran Khan has been put by the army in Pakistan to support their narrative. 
India Pakistan issue is the domain of the Pakistan army. The politicians in Pakistan, I am reminded of the words of Emma Duncan of a book called Breaking the Curfew. It's a write up, a wonderful story, collection of uh, accounts of her experiences in Pakistan. She was BBC journal, economist as journalist then, but she now uh, is one of the very senior economist journalists. And I think she edits that uh, magazine. Uh, 1948 or something like that. There is a magazine that comes out by The Economist. But anyway, what she said that when Zia died, suddenly the Shalwar Kurtawala politicians had started sitting outside Zia's funeral event and started negotiating and horse trading with them all. Behind them stood men in khaki with medals on their chest, with pea caps, with a smile on their face, like school teachers allow children to play in the playground and saying to them that we'll blow the whistle when your time's up. That is Pakistan's story. So don't look at every leader in Pakistan as though he's an elected leader and he can do things which Mr. Narendra Modi can in India. You cannot. Because in Pakistan, the sham of an election, as somebody rightly said, the elections were already done. Only the formality of going through the process was gone through with when the people went to the polls. Because the choices had already been made by the army that Imran will win. So the fact is, and when you become president, prime minister of Pakistan, you also uh, are in a tricky situation. Because you get on the military's wrong side. On a happy day, you'll go to jail. On a bad day, you'll die. Okay. So that kind of a situation we have on our border with Pakistan. Now the problem is that Pakistan, as Madeleine Albright said, is a global migraine. It's a headache. You have to learn how to deal with it. And I believe that a weak Pakistan and an unstable Pakistan is good for India. I don't buy the argument of a whole lot of our thinkers in Delhi, especially the Jholawalas, who turn around and say that a strong Pakistan is good for India. Give me the logic. If it's strong, it'll start needling you again. If it's weak and unsettled, it'll be too bothered about its own problems with bomb blasts here and bomb blasts there to bother about you. So please understand that don't look at strengthening Pakistan. Strengthen yourself to be able to present Pakistan with a whole lot of sad alternatives that whatever they may take you on on, they don't have a choice. They will lose out against you. And that is what is your essential defense preparedness on the territorial area is all about. When you come to the other threats within, you have to, as I said at the start, you have to think collectively of national security. It's no more that that is the policeman's war, that is the CRPF's war, and the army will fight the war on a good day 15 years from now. It's not going to be like that. You have to all work together towards an a national goal and a national objective, which is to make India strong, resilient, and capable to respond in double quick time to any emergency that comes our way. How do you do that? You need to have exchanges between the leadership, the politicians, the bureaucrats, and the military on a far more aggressive and a regular way. Amos Palmuter, an American social scientist, about 40 years ago coined a term called fusionism. Fusionism is when the political, bureaucratic, and military leaders of a country fuse together to work towards national purposes. Unfortunately, we are all working at cross purposes. So we are not getting our best of our energies to work together national interest. You have to create, as the general has been closely involved with, and many others are, you have to create a defense industrial base. You can't pay lip service to indigenization and 70 years later can't manufacture even a first class armored fighting vehicle because all the weapon systems and platforms, and I'm sorry to say in this public gathering, the one area that make in India has fallen flat on his face is on defense production. I'd like to be challenged on that, but I need facts and figures to convince me otherwise. And it has fallen flat on its face because for too long we've allowed self-serving self, uh, bureaucracies to generate a culture of nepotism and lethargy in our defense industrial base. 
I cannot believe that a country like Israel, which became a country in 1948 and we got our independence in 47 and we had a lot more going for us then, that so many years later is one of the world's top exporters of military weapon systems and our top-notch organizations including the HAL, which claims that, you know, the ex-HAL chief goes on record to say that we could have done the Rafale deal when the current HAL chief said that we are not in the H offsets business. And the last air chief who is retired mentioned to me in a reasonably small but a high quality public gathering in Calcutta to say the HAL is only a licensed manufacturer, not a manufacturer, but a licensed assembler of manufactured goods. So let's not flatter ourselves by saying that we can produce this, that, and the other. We are damn good at assembling things, but we need to be able to come out with cutting edge stuff. And the only area where we have produced world-class defense equipment is in missile technology. Why? Because there were no restrictions put on us in what we could buy and what we couldn't buy in terms of military wherewithal. So go out and buy the best, so the armed forces needed the best toys for their boys. So they went out and got the best aircrafts, best this thing, and the governments, successive governments gave whatever money was available for defense modernization. And modernization was equal to buy it after the usual processes are all completed. And I know there will be a question on Rafael later in the day, but buy it as per the process, what you think is best. But at no stage, we were giving timelines to our defense PSUs to say that, okay, this time we are buying it, but 15 years later, we want first-rate aircraft, tanks, and ships to be built up by you. Ships, yes, we've done some progress because the Navy is the only of the three services which has an engineering and defense manufacturing uh, vision. And they have design teams that work on it, and therefore, even the Ariane is much of Navy's hard work with a lot of Russian guidance. Not American guidance, by the way. Now, I come to what else do you need to do to build your capabilities? You need to build your capabilities to take on the threats from outer space. Our services have started making space commands and space desks in their headquarters which are looking at space. Because it is from there, it is from cyber attacks, and it is from the unseen warriors that the next wars are going to be fought. They are not going to be fought simply with tanks rolling across the border this way or that way. That will happen for a few days in the event of another big terror attack and push comes to shove. We might take on the choice of pushing in large-scale uh, armored formations right across the Rajasthan-Punjab border, which now has been admitted after years of reluctance uh, as the cold start strategy. Cold start always existed, but successive service chiefs never mustered the gut in, guts enough to say it in public that cold start existed. And believe me, when you say things like this, it makes Pakistan nervous. The aim is to keep the enemy unsettled, ladies and gentlemen, because at the end of the day, national security is about projecting yourself at least few scales up the notch than what you are. Because when your enemy is nervous, people say a nervous enemy could press the button. You don't press nuclear buttons after a drink at night. Nuclear buttons are pressed or not pressed after a lot of deliberation. And four serious war games that have been carried out world over to see in the event of a conflict would India and Pakistan ever reach the nuclear threshold. And for those of you who are unaware, of the 44 thresholds of a conflict, when nations have nuclear weapons could go on to the ladders. Lead countries have to pass 22 thresholds before they even contemplate deploying of nuclear weapons. And deploying of nuclear weapons means marrying the warhead to the launch system and then deploying them and then seriously consider launching them. It takes an awfully long time. And in that awful long time, there is a lot of world pressure that will come on you to say, call it off. So you are safe, if that makes you more comfortable. And Pakistani threats that they could use tactical nuclear weapons are based, as usual, on Pakistan's short-sightedness. 
because they say those will be used in the event of an Indian advance into key tactical or strategic positions within Pakistan. That means those weapons which have a kill area of 5 to 10 kilometers would be used within Pakistan. Where would we be advancing? We'd be advancing mostly into Punjab and Pakistan. 74% of Pakistan's army are made of Punjabi generals. Would they kill their own cousins? They won't. So they won't use tactical nuclear weapons. So they are hati ke daat. Nuclear weapons, ladies and gentlemen, wo dikhane ke hai, khane ke nahi hai. So that is what you, but you need to have it. Why do you need to have it? You need to, as Jaswant Singh had said after Vajpayee Ji articulated India's broad structure of India's nuclear doctrine of 15th April 1999, uh, he spelt out that you know our nuclear doctrine would be A, no first use against a non-nuclear weapon state. Again, we will never initiate a nuclear conflict and most importantly, uh, the need to build minimum deterrence capability and a triad. And triad we have achieved. Minimum de deterrence capability we've achieved. You don't need 400 bombs to blow up Pakistan. 100 bombs are enough to make Pakistan in the event of a conflict uh, cease to exist as a viable state. As General Park Banavan had once said during Op Parakram when somebody asked him a question that if Pakistan uses nuclear weapons with your deployment, what you do? He says India's response would be so severe that Pakistan will cease to exist as a viable state. So we are comfortable. That's what I want to leave you with that thought. But the most important thing is two other threats that we are battling. One is the threat of terrorism. General Saab brought it out. Jammu and Kashmir is unique because, and I'm not saying unique because every Kashmiri likes to believe he's God's chosen citizen, but it's not on that ground. It is unique from the perspective of national security. It is a territory of India which has two nuclear powers staring down on India on that territory. Both have agendas. The agenda is not the hearts and minds of the people of Kashmir. It is the waters of Kashmir. It is what Pakistan should have articulated in the very first place in 1947 and their argument would have been taken a little more seriously on the global stage. I can give you a whole lecture on Jammu and Kashmir, but let me just explain to you that Pakistan has repeatedly tied itself up, itself up in knots simply because it was created on a Muslim state argument and therefore they argued the case of Kashmir on a Muslim-Muslim factor. It is not that. It is the waters of Kashmir, which a water staff Pakistan is always eyeing. But China has begun to eye those waters. And that is why China has begun to divert some of the glaciers in the glacial region. The fight over Siachen Glacier is about the waters. The glacier is the largest glacier outside the polar region and houses expectedly over 100 million cubic cc's of water. And that kind of water would be enough for the needs of many of the cities of North India if we were to harness it. We are completely in control of Siachen Glacier, whatever the lies the Pakistanis say. You have to go there to see that they are, as the crow flies, about five to 10 kilometers away from something called the Saltoro Range. And on this side of the range lies the glacier. We are sitting on top of the range. So they just can't even have a peek at the glacier. But they've created some other icy spots, which they call Siachin Camp. And they take their journalists there who do peace to cameras and say, hum Siachin mein khade hain. Aap Samajh So now Kashmir, China and Pakistan are eyeing it. Kashmir is also the ground for cross-border terrorism. Kashmir is also the area for an internal insurgency which has connections to cross-border terrorism. But let us not fool ourselves. We have repeatedly lost the plot in Kashmir. Every time the military stabilize the situation, the politicians and the bureaucrats, and the politicians because the bureaucracy was too busy sinking its, uh, sipping its cups of tea and trying to look at inane files and ideas, didn't come up with suitable ideas to then provide the people of Kashmir a socio-political economic package to address the core grievances. Insurgencies don't start, ladies and gentlemen, I've done a book on that. They don't start because somebody comes and whispers in your ear that Azadi is a very good thing. It starts because it builds up in a people for a long time. That emotional build up in the people's mind that you are not going to get your due in the society that you live in leads you to look elsewhere. 
and that is when you get and it is not a coincidence that the two major insurgencies that we've had that is in JNK and even earlier in Punjab and of course the long running low key insurgencies in India's northeast have always been on border areas. We don't really have other than the left wing insurgency that as Modi ji once said in a lecture which I had the privilege of sharing the dais with him in Ahmedabad many years ago when he was Mukhya Mantri and he said, Ek khun ki dhara jo hai, jo pashupati se tirupati tak chal rahi hai. That is going from Nepal right to Andhra. That is the red corridor that we have to address. But there are ways to address it and we have not done enough because there is a problem and if I offend some sentiments here, I'm sorry, but let me tell you the problem is we've left the battle to bureaucrats who don't have an idea how to deal with it because yesterday he was in the agriculture ministry, today he's in the home ministry and since agriculture is a very big part of the national economy, so he thinks he's doing one of the same things, but the home ministry does completely different things and the agriculture ministry does completely different things. Firstly, he doesn't have an idea of what he's doing. Secondly, you have police officers in charge of insurgency who are too scared to step in into the grounds where the insurgencies are taking place. And those insurgencies have to be fought by commanders on the ground. I've had a DG CRPF confide in me and I've brought it out in my forthcoming book, which is going to be titled Battling Insurgencies, that 103 battalions of CRPF are deployed in the Naxal areas that would classically require, require, and the general can correct me, at least 10 major generals, if not more, and at least two lieutenant generals, if not three, to be in charge of the operations. What do you have? You're lucky if you get two IGs who don't even have the experience of hardened major generals who are commanding divisions in areas like JNK or the Northeast because they were probably earlier looking after some town as commissioner police there and now they've been asked to battle this because they're deputed to the CRPF because at that level you don't have the same carder going up. You have the local carder who rise up in rank because of experience and they can only go up to DIG level if I'm not wrong. So beyond that, you have people who are coming in who are not understanding. You're not involving the army. The army doesn't want to get involved because it says, you know, we are looking after external threats. We are stretched as it is. But they're the only people who have the longest running set of experience in battling insurgencies. So this insurgency, though it has not crept into our lives to that extent as Kashmir has because of television screens and people in the area of JNK who are regularly victims of that, or in the Northeast where parts of Northeast are completely brought to a standstill. But this is an insurgency which is a problem because in some parts the insurgent is an insurgent in another state just across the border, he's a vote bank. And we are not coming to a national consensus that what is a vote bank, what is an anti-national element, what is an asset and what is a liability. So there is a threat there on national security. I finally will tell you that what do we need in terms, and then I'll open myself up to Q&A, what do we need in terms of the wherewithal? We need more money for our military preparedness and I'm not just advocating for the armed forces. I believe the police and paramilitary also need a lot more money. You can't short shrift that because the singular responsibility of any government is to protect the citizens of the country, not to only protect the politicians and the VIPs. Unfortunately, most of the police and security elements, at least in Lachi and Delhi, are busy protecting the VIPs, so the citizens have to fend for themselves. And they get these private security agencies who don't have weapons, and you're obviously going to have a Klashnikov wielding terrorist coming towards you, and you're going to have a Lati and a torchlight showing towards him and saying, don't come towards me. So we are in a very unhappy situation. And the same ex-servicemen who was earlier trusted with a weapon is today not trusted with a weapon because he's out of the service, so he can't carry a weapon except a Shikar 12 Pro. And a Shikar 12 bore is not good enough to deal with the automatic AK-47. So we need more weapons. We need more wherewithal <coughs> in terms of internal security. We need technologies. We need high level of computerization. The CCNT, CCNTS, which was a program to link all the major police stations, the crime and tracking national records. The NatGrid system, they have almost been left in a lurch now after the UPA government 
went away. Not a work had gone into it. Let us not reinvent the wheel every time. We have a lot of repository of expertise that is existing in the country. Work has been done. So we are, as I mentioned in the beginning, ladies and gentlemen, we are challenged because we have, for us, time has been telescoped. We have to achieve in 50 years what the world achieved in 250 years. How can we become a great power if we are not stable? How can anybody invest in our country if it doesn't see India as a country where his factory won't go up in smoke? He needs to get that level of comfort that is not going to come by only exchange at the highest level where he's assured, come and invest in India and we look after everything. Not only we've not been able to do away with our many uh, corridors of red tape, but we have not been able to provide a hundred percent assurance to anybody that you will not face a possible attack on your infrastructure. And 2611 was meant to do precisely that. It was meant to dampen investor confidence in India. That Bombay is not, or Mumbai is not a city worth visiting because you'll get attacked. Indian hotels are not safe. So don't come with your money bags to India. It might be flowing fly into Karachi, which they thought was perhaps safer, as we know it's otherwise. Then you have to provide more money for your cyber security capability, fighting capabilities at all levels. You have to get more satellites in place. If we can make satellites which are cheaper than a Hollywood film, then maybe we have to make more Hollywood films. But we have to have more satellites. Every patch of India must be monitored by satellites. I know there are a lot of free speech wallahs will turn around and say, you're thinking of making India a police state. I'd rather have India as a police state than a threatened state. More importantly, we need to guard against external threats and we need to shape up to the expectations of the big powers because they want us to punch in our weight category. And that is the last point I want to make. With ships, missiles, aircrafts, tanks, if you want to be a big power, ladies and gentlemen, nobody's going to open the door for you. You have to open the door of the Security Council, pull a chair and sit down. Otherwise, the world's going to keep, you keep waiting outside with a slip in your hand. But Pancho Desho ne humko except China, and Charo Desho ne humko except China ne, hum, they have recommended us, now give us a seat inside. Nobody gives you a seat inside. Some of you might be a bit shocked to know that we were offered a seat in the Security Council, where the great Pandit Ji, Pandit Nehru, said, pass it on to China, our time will come when it comes. And you miss the boat again. So idealism has no place in world affairs. You have to be hard-headed, hard-nosed, and you have to have a very hard vision about what is your national interest. And if everyone has to pitch in for that, as the good general had alerted us to that, we have to pitch in in every way. We have to become eyes and ears of the government. We have to support the police systems, the security agencies, and let us not just think that only a man in uniform who stands on the border is responsible for national security or should be given the respect for national security. Every good citizen contributes to the nation's security. I'll end with that, ladies and gentlemen. I'm open to question and answer.